unmatched in his grim determination to deliver the news, Paperboy does daily battle with the forces of darkness and evil. Another episode of Classic Gaming Brothers. I'm Zach. And I'm Seth. And we're the Classic Gaming Brothers. We are the Classic Gaming we Brothers. We are the Classic Gaming Brothers. You said we're the we're. We're? Do you say, do you say we're the Classic Gaming Brothers? Do you say we are we the are. Classic I think Gaming I thought I said we are the Classic Gaming Brothers. No, you definitely said we're. Like the contraction of we are. We. You know what? I mean that's right. that's not grammatically inaccurate. No, it's not grammatically inaccurate. I just wonder if maybe Doug can tell us uh, how many times you say we are and how many times you say we're. At least I didn't say off. we were the classic game <laughs> brothers. <laughs> That'd and be then a you sad... turn around and Agent Forty Seven is standing there with his bow, bald bow, hair. Bow, bow. No, that's James Bond. Speaking of which, did you see that Knives Out is getting a sequel? It's I did exciting. see that Knives Out is getting a sequel, and everyone's in it. Seth, what have you been recently playing? Recently, I have been playing a game called Ape Out, which was created by Gabe Cusillo, Bennett Fadi, and Matt Bosch. And I'm sure I pronounced all their names incorrectly. And it was published by Devolver Digital, who is... Our good friends. They are our great friends. And in the game, you are in the control of a large ape-like creature that is escaping from containment. And it's a top-down view with graphics that are pretty colorful. Like the, the entire game palette has a pretty colorful play to it. The ape in question is uh, bright orange, where the rest of the world is kind of like a dull blue. The gameplay is very frenetic, with a lot of en- energy and fast-paced type of uh, game that plays from the top-down. Also, it's a it's a restricted top-down view, so you can only kind of see what the ape can see. So there's, like, parts of the map are, like, shut off from you, even, like, door shut, but you can see through glass. You have to navigate through these different mazes while there are people trying to kill you and you get three shots and you're dead which actually will segue nicely into our episode you'll get uh three shots and you'll die and there is like a progressively more difficult enemies that you encounter so like first you'll just have guys with guns and then you'll have guys with body armor and guns and then you'll have guys with dynamite on the back of them that they'll throw at you and so on and so forth it's also very gory as uh sometimes devolver digital games often are when you hit somebody they go flying because you're a large ape so if you hit somebody they just fly across the room if they hit a wall they explode into blood and like you can then pick up their limbs and you can throw their limbs at people if you get shot then you get splat like you have like this orange goop that comes out of you you actually it plays differently when after you've been shot so like the first time you get shot you're like a little slower and you'll like bleed everywhere as you go so you'll make like a path and the more you get shot up until the third time uh you will go slower and slower until you until you die which i thought was unique and then after you complete a maze as it were you will uh go back to being full health uh so the the graphics are very stylized so it's it's very not it's not like you're watching like a like a true representation of an ape att- like killing people. It's like shapes that are you can understand that it's an ape, but it doesn't necessarily it looks like an orange creature type thing. So it's very like pop stylized. And what I what I really liked about it is that the music and the maps are all randomly generated. So each playthrough could, can be different as you go through different missions. Also the music is going to be different. And it all is a it's a it's a jazz drum score that plays. And as you 
hit somebody and they die, uh, it will play the the symbol kind of thing. And it it gets the music kind of goes up and down based on the tempo of your gameplay. So if you get really like, if you start just like fleeing and everyone's coming around you, the, the music gets really, really, really fast. And then it'll like slow down if you're able to like stealth around a little bit. Because there are stealth aspects. So the entire, I, I mentioned before that the, it's a very colorful palette for the entire game but if uh so for example if the lights go out or an alarm starts going the palette changes and completely changes the entire like look and feel of the game which is kind of cool it plays over these segments that are called discs and there are four discs and each disc has uh two sides of four so there's eight levels or so for each disc and then there's a, a bonus level if you complete all of the game uh you get achievements too if you get through with like out getting shot or killed or something like that which is very tough but it's a fun game i realized when i first started playing i was just like going around like nuts just killing everybody kind of like hotline miami which the game kind of also feels a little bit like but i realized <laughs> i kept dying a lot and i was like you know i i should actually approach this like a maze and just try and solve the puzzle and once i started doing that i started uh, completing the mission and what's what's cool is if you die it zooms out and says dead but in between the dead the letters for DEAD, uh, it has the map of the mission and it shows you how far you got into the mission. And it'll show you the path you took. So if you took like this weird circuitous route, it would show you like circling back in on yourself and like just where you're like, oh wow, I was really lost in this mission. So I thought that was kind of cool. But yeah, so it's uh, Ape Out, uh, published by Devolver Digital and created by Gabe Bennett and Matt. It's fun. So, yeah, it's a lot of fun. For some reason, when I saw the name Ape Out, I was thinking of Ape Escape, which is a different mm. game. No, but we did see Ape Out at PAX. So, Zach. Yes, Seth. What have you been playing? Seth, recently I've been playing Mace Griffin Bounty Hunter, which was developed in 2003 by Warthog Games. It's garbage. It is wow. a garbage video game that uh, nice. I don't enjoy. Have you beaten it? No. Well, are you planning on beating it? Probably not. You're going to resell it? Yeah, I don't I don't know if it's worth anything. Uh, are you bring, it, bring it back to Savers? <laughs> I might, yeah. So I bought the game at Savers, which for those who don't know, is a thrift store chain here in the Northeast. I think they have some locations elsewhere in the United States, but they go by a couple other names elsewhere, like Value Village, I believe is also under the Savers brand. Anyway, the game is kind of like a knockoff of Halo and Red Faction, at least in terms of design and gameplay from what I've played. And that's giving it a lot of um, praise because Halo and Red Faction are both great games. It plays really poorly uh, and I just had a bad time the entire time I played. So I guess to describe what I mean by it playing very very poorly is not only does it look bad for a 2003 video game which you know i look back at halo which came out in 2001 not a great looking game by today's standards but it's not a bad looking game even playing the 2001 version of halo because right. i believe they they did remaster it and but even playing the original is it's still pretty like solid graphics i've been re-watching classic red versus blue which was all done in the halo one engine so uh i think it still looks good uh, despite the limitations of the engine at the time this game doesn't look good one other problem with this game is there's no weight to any of the weapons so you start off the game with like a stun baton and this chain gun that you have no ammo for and like when you shoot the chain gun when you do get ammo or you shoot a pistol that you later get just none of the weapons have any impact to them so it feels like you're just i don't know if i feel like i'm playing like airsoft with these enemies mm -hmm. where just like there's no impact sounds the guns don't even sound that they're not loud it's just those tiny details that you get in other first person shooters that makes them so makes it feel like you're really playing a game that like and makes you feel like the weapons you are using are actually making a difference yeah they have some weight to them or in physics yeah so not again to compare too much to halo uh, I just did because the the UI in the game is like identical to Halo's UI, uh, which is one of the reasons why I was like, this reminds me a lot of Halo in a bad way. But in Halo, for example, the pistol you get is a very satisfying weapon. Uh, it makes a really nice loud sound. And when you hit things, there is enough feedback that you get as a player to know that you have done damage to the 
the thing that you've shot. Yeah, it's a, it's a crunchy noise too. In this game, I don't know if I'm doing damage to the enemies I shot because there's no feedback to the weapon when I'm shooting them. I sometimes see little splurts of blood coming off their bodies, but that's about it. It just doesn't feel like I'm doing anything when I'm when I'm attacking these people. Uh, yeah, and also the controls are just wonky and I can't really figure out the aim. So like if I fire my chain gun it just kind of like spreads around in the whole region it doesn't really hit the target i'm aiming at if i fire my pistol it kind of does the same thing there's no really no way to like aim your pistol at one person like it, it, it's hard to explain but when you fire off like four rounds off the pistol they all hit different places <laughs> your aim is just inconsistent the entire time and it's hard to predict if you're even going to hit the enemy that you're aiming at. So I'm bashing this game a lot, but to, to <laughs> explain a little bit about, is it game, really that bad? It's, it's pretty, it's, 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 pretty, it's, it's pretty bad. Maybe I'll jump back into it. Who knows to explain a bit about the game in the game. You play as the titular Mace Griffin, who is in fact a bounty hunter in a alternate universe future set in a universe called the Wagner system, which is kind of like a old West futuristic world that you explore. So it has some elements that are definitely inspired by like Western movies, but it's set in space and you fight bad guys and aliens. And, and as much as you'd expect from a game where you're playing as a guy whose name is Mace Griffin, Mace Bounty Griffin. Hunter. That's his full name. <laughs> First name is Mace Griffin. Last name is Bounty Hunter. I didn't get to this point yet, but there are segments in the game where you can jump into spaceships and go into dogfights with them. Um, what's cool though, is that it's a seamless transition. So from you jumping into the spaceship from the ground, launching up into space and engaging in a dogfight, it's a seamless you know, from ground to space transition without really like a loading screen or anything like that, which I think is cool. That's that's a unique thing for the time. We didn't really have that with a lot of video games, especially in 2003. I, and, and like to this day, that is something that certain video games will use as their selling points. Um, I know, for example, uh, No Man's Sky, that was a big deal. No Man's Sky, the fact that you can go from the ground into your spaceship up into space in a seamless transition without any cutscenes or any sort of loading screen or anything like that. So for that to exist in a 2003 game, I will say props to Mace Griffin Bounty Hunter uh, for, for getting that little action done. That is pretty cool. That being said, I don't know if I want to play the game enough to actually get to the dogfighting segments to see how good they are or how bad they are. So... Um, I might not ever experience that neat little piece of gaming history, but who knows? Maybe I'll return to Mace Griffin, Bounty Hunter, but that's the game I've been playing. So we played another game about a bounty hunter. Star Wars Bounty Hunter? <laughs> On the GameCube? Yeah, yeah, Bounty Hunter. And and then I broke it? Yes, you did break <laughs> it. Broke it really badly. Was it as good as that broken experience or worse? It was worse. Because in the broken Bounty Hunter experience, you were still playing as Jango Fett, who's more it's interesting true. than Mace Griffin Bounty Hunter. I, I guess yeah sure i do like that you compared the game to a halo a lot and it was developed by warthog games which is a car in halo i did think that was funny too well <laughs> today we have a special game to talk about it is I guess so. one of excuse me well i i mean i guess it's special in the sense that i don't know if there's anyone who hasn't heard of paperboy well perhaps there are people out there who haven't heard of paperboy and you just be. ruined the whole segue that I was going on to. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll let you do the segue exciting... again. I'll cut out my whole spiel. No, it's fine. It's better just to leave it in. And so that's right. We're going to be talking about Paperboy today, which is a tough game. Oh, yeah. I, yeah it's hard. I, you, you could say that it's iconic since it's Paperboy, and, and I'm sure that people have played it. But if you're not, if you're if you're a younger listener, or maybe just haven't decided that you want to play Paperboy, you can certainly boot it up and be extremely frustrated with it, as we were when we were playing it earlier before uh, recording to refresh our memories. And speaking of memories, Zach. Do you have any memories of Paperboy? I don't have too many memories of it. I do remember playing it at a family friend of ours, who I think they had a copy for the Sega Genesis. Or I think it was Nintendo. It wasn't Nintendo. Super Nintendo. I think it was Super, Super Nintendo. 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 I remember they had Maybe a copy of it for some system. I do remember being very bad at it because I didn't understand that you had to throw the paper at certain houses. I thought you just had to throw the paper wherever. Um, so I did. I would like just throw the paper as, as many papers as I could. And I caused a lot of probably damage, probably injured some people, probably lost some points probably was fired from my paperboy job but that's the fun way to play paperboy another memory i have of paperboy is not actually playing it but 
a popular YouTuber, the Angry Video Game Nerd, who's played by uh, filmmaker James Rolfe, uh, frequently uses the Paperboy music from the NES version of the game in the background of some of his older videos, which I remember watching as a kid. So sometimes when I hear the theme to Paperboy, uh, which I'll put in probably at the beginning of this episode, I like immediately have this nostalgic flashback to like sitting on my old Windows XP laptop watching Angry Video Game Nerd videos at night with my headphones on hoping our mom wouldn't hear the episode because James Rolfe swears a lot in those episodes but yeah so that's kind of an, another memory of Paperboy Paperboy tangent I guess or Paperboy adjacent <laughs> if, it's, as it's would. A, an adjacent memory to Paperboy yeah what about you so I have similar memories I we did have a family friend that had Paperboy it was in their basement I can vaguely remember how the television was set up and like how the basement was decorated and I remember they had Paperboy and it was my first time playing Paperboy and I think the thing that I remember most from Paperboy was like the screeching and oh yeah because you could make like a screeching noise in the game I think it was the cars so if I think if you if you drove in the road you would sometimes hear cars breaking and it was this yes. loud screeching sound. Definitely remember that for sure. And then uh, I also remember uh, throwing the paper poorly and not. There's just a lot going on in Paperboy if you aren't like paying attention and uh, you can be easily defeated. Though I was very bad at throwing the paper. Though I think the fun part I like that if you go to the. <laughs> The non it's like the difference between a subscriber to the paper and a non subscriber to the paper is like night and day. It's mm. like this is a really nice house. They subscribe to your newspaper, and then they're like, "This is where Satan lives," and it's just like this evil, dark, like house with cobwebs and like it just is like it says "get out" on their like mat and stuff like that. And I always remember that you could like just like pelt that like non-subscriber house with as much paper as you wanted to because you get like breakage points. And I just enjoyed uh, I just enjoyed the contrast between like these people subscribe to the paper and thus are good people and these people don't subscribe they must be evil and i was so like i always had this conceived notion where like i was like oh man you got to be subscribed to the paper or you don't want to be like viewed as this like this abandoned house because you don't accept the paper and it's like thought like was buried to like today in my mind i'm like i should probably subscribe to the paper just to like have a paper delivered so i'm not a house that's going to get pegged with papers obviously that wouldn't happen because that would be vandal i'm sure well i'm sure paper boys have damaged houses before but probably accidentally instead of purposely coming by my house because i'm not a subscriber i also remember that i didn't get very far in the game i know that you can play through all the different days and i don't think i ever made it past tuesday which i think is like the second is, level so yes since it starts on monday <laughs> tuesday would in fact be the second level uh so not very far in the game at all and each day gets progressively harder which we'll we'll talk about kind of later on in the episode but yeah yeah so that's uh kind of my vague memories i just remember i remember they had a white carpet i remember they had a tv that was like set to an entertainment system in the back wall maybe in a built-in and that they had paperboy and that's what i that's what i remember these memories are all flooding back to me now as well <laughs> that's good so to get a little into the history of the gameplay and just some facts about paperboy the game was developed by Atari Games and Midway in 1985. I think this is like the third time Midway has come up in the last four episodes. So Midway? Yeah, well, Midway does a lot of stuff. No, I know, but I feel like we just keep mentioning Midway. The cabinet itself was an upright machine with a bicycle handlebar controller, which was actually a modified yoke or uh, handlebar steering system from the Star Wars machine. So, um, and I actually, I looked at a picture of the bicycle handlebar for the Paperboy machine and it is literally just like a repainted version of the star wars one which i think is hilarious the buttons on each side of the controller throws the paper and the handlebars can be pushed forward to accelerate or pulled back to break um so kind of giving you a little uh like almost realism i guess to the game it makes you feel like you're actually maybe pedaling on that bicycle the game ran on an atari system 2 which was their arcade board that they used for some of their arcades in the 1980s it used a 10 megahertz dec or digital equipment corporation t11 cpu 
and a 6502 processor for the sound and the coin inputs. The game was written in Bliss, B-L-I-S-S, which was originally written for the deck line of computers such as the PDP-10 and the PDP-11. Uh, it was also a popular programming language for the arcade systems, especially when you were using DEC CPUs. The game was programmed by John Salwitz and designed by Salwitz, Dave Ralston, Russell Dahl, and Carl Bedard. Uh, with music composed by Hal Cannon and Earl Vickers. I feel like we've mentioned some of these names before in previous episodes, but I, I looked up a few of the names that sounded familiar, and I didn't see any titles of things that we have done recently. So they might have just either very common name, like I think Ralston was one that I recognized, um, so maybe it was just a, a similar name. But if uh, our continuity expert, Doug, wants to remind us if we've talked about any of these developers in the past, um, that would be very much appreciated. Uh, another cool thing about Paperboy was it did use digitized voices, uh, which was actually kind of unique for arcade games at the time. Um, some other arcade games that used digitized voices were like the Star Wars arcade game, which had a very digitized Obi-Wan impersonator saying, Yo, it's the boss, Luke. Uh, <laughs> in, like really digitized voice. Yeah, the digitized voice, they're they're great. They're, it's like a staple of like, they, you, you, everyone sounds similar-ish. Yeah. And it's definitely, it's probably not even a voice actor, right? Because it's probably just made with oh, sounds. Oh, well, they used voice samples. So a lot of times it was, yeah. a lot of times it was just like a programmer though, who was like, who wasn't like a professional voice actor. H heavily, heavily modified programmer, right? But it's like Bill from accounting. What I like is that all of the, all the audio clips not only sound the same, probably because a lot of them were done by the same guys, but also they all sound like a person who just has like their mouth filled with marbles. <laughs> oh yeah yeah for like sure. it just sounds like they shoved a bunch of like stuff in their mouth and were like oh, 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 oh. <laughs> well so let's talk about the game in paperboy you would play as a paperboy most likely for a small town uh since as we'll get into later sometimes you are the subject of the paper at the beginning of each round you are told what houses that you are that are subscribed to your paper and the paper that you represent is the Daily Sun, and which ones are not subscribers. Then you ride down the street on your bike, and you throw papers at the appropriate houses. You do have a limited supply of papers that you can throw, so you can't just spam the papers. However, there are paper pickups that you can run into to get more papers to throw. Now, while riding down, the, so if it wasn't easy enough to make sure that you can throw your paper at the appropriate house and get it in the right spot, you also have to avoid obstacles such as pedestrians, pets, cars backing out of their driveway, and other assorted things that may cause chaos. You also, as we stated, have to throw the paper at the appropriate house at the right spot. So you can't break any of their windows. I mean, well, you could break their windows, but you should not break the subscriber windows. And you need to get it on their doorstep or in their mailbox. And the game gets ported. This game has been ported to a number of systems and it was ported very quickly to the home console. So it was on the arcade and then was also on home consoles very quickly and it was on a lot of home consoles since the game was in in a sense pretty easy to uh, replicate on different systems and in later ports of the games you you are able to play as a paper girl instead of a paper boy now i also remember some great obstacles some that there was like a guy that was like break dancing in the middle of the sidewalk there were uh two guys fighting uh there was a, a burglar trying to break into the house what i really liked about paperboy is that you could disrupt these people doing their things by either hitting them with a bike being that you just ride into them or by throwing a paper at them and so you could you could stop the burglar from burglarizing a house if you peg him in the face with the paper. You could help one of the guys in a fight, letting the left or the right guy win by hitting either the left or the right guy with the paper or your bike. And then if you hit him with the bike, the the other guy will like throw his hands up in victory because the other guy got knocked out. So I think it's interesting that they include these obstacles that are also kind of interactive beyond just being obstacles in the way. Now, the way that you, you would 
uh, play the game, you would, you would select first your difficulty level. And the difficulties levels were split up to easy street, middle road, or the hard way. Playing each of those difficulty levels would give you a multiplier on top of the points that you would earn. And in order to earn those points, you would need to deliver your newspaper to either the subscriber's mailbox or the doorstep. The mailbox would give you 250 points and the doorstep would give you 100 points. And then they were multiplied based on the difficulty. So if you were playing Easy Street, they would just be what they are, 250 or 100 points. Uh, middle Road would be 2x, so 500 points or 200 points. And three times for uh, Hard Way, so you would have uh, 750 points or 300 points for um, landing on each either the getting in the mailbox or getting it on the doorstep. Furthermore, you could get breakage points, which were probably my favorite points to get. And you would get breakage points from running over flowers or throwing papers into the windows of non-subscribers' houses, which I guess would defeat the purpose. Or you could get a free paper, right? I mean, the newspaper company is probably going to have to fix your window, and you got a free paper because it came through your living room. Now, the paper boy would have three lives, and could get killed pretty easily in the game. Uh, and if you were killed three times, then you as a paper boy would quit. And you're not killed. You're like, you have an accident on your bike. If you have three accidents, then you're, you're out. And if you quit, you would actually make front page and it will talk about how bad of a paper boy you are and that you quit in defiance. And uh, also, if you destroyed, if you destroyed windows of subscribers and law, uh, you could lose subscribers and you could actually lose the game by ruining your subscribers. You could you then the the paper would also talk about how bad of a paper boy you are and you could beat the game by getting through the week. So you have to play from Monday through Sunday and each day got progressively harder and you had to keep your subscribers up and you also didn't you had to avoid dying. Um, I The game is very, very, very temperamental when it comes to what you can hit and what you cannot hit. So, for example, there are grates in the city streets. You cannot hit those. You will die. There's, like, obvi the obvious things, like fences and the people and stuff like that, but very, like, sometimes there's, like, very minor things that you're like, ah, oh, I can just hit this obstacle. No, no. Cars will drive in the driveway. You also have a, a very limited play area. Uh, to the left, so you're out, you're riding on the sidewalk. There's a little bit of road that you can go into, and there's a little bit of grass that you can go into, and there's guaranteed to be some sort of obstacles on each of those. Now, with the game, obviously, a popular arcade game, there came home releases. So a year after it was released in the arcade, home ports began to hit the market. Versions of the game first appeared on systems like the BBC Micro and the Acorn Electron over in the UK, but soon versions of the game were made for the Amstrad CPC, the Apple II, the TRS-80 Color Computer, um, as well as versions for the ZX Spectrum, Commodore 64, as well as the Commodore 16 and the Commodore Plus 4. In 1988, a company called Eastridge Technology ported the game to the Nintendo Entertainment System, and in 1991, the game was released on the Sega Genesis and Sega Game Gear. Now, versions also existed for the Sega Master System, which was allegedly one of the better ports, the Game Boy, the Atari Lynx, the Amiga, the Atari ST, and MS-DOS. So, definitely a popular game, I would say. Yeah, it, it was a very popular game. Uh, it quickly earned the slot of being one of the top-selling arcade machines in 1985 in Japan and the seventh best computer game in 1986 in the UK. This, I mean, seven is a pretty good number to have. In case anyone was curious, Yi Ar Kung Fu was number one that year. Also on that list was Ghosts and Goblins coming in at number six, nice. which we've talked about in the past. I love Ghosts and Goblins. During our spooky it episode it's ghost and goblins is tough so but the game was was very successful as uh as evident by the amount of ports that it received in sequels however it was very difficult to find sale information out there for it yeah that was one of the that was one of the downsides about the history of paperboy it's a great game but it was kind of hard to just track down some of the more uh detailed numbers that we usually get with our episodes I, which I think is because of the um, multi companies involved. 
Yes. So it was uh, Atari and Midway. And then all of the there companies also... involved in the in the porting. So, I mean, the game the game was ported to personal computers and then to the home consoles immediately in 1986, a year after the game came out. So, And there was a ton of companies involved in the process. So I think some of that information just might be lost to time or might be get muddled with other information. So the game did see a sequel in the name of Paperboy 2, which was released on a variety of home video game systems and handhelds. Did not get an arcade release, though. In Paperboy 2, the game is fairly close to the original, but you have to deliver to both sides of the street now because in paperboy one it's only one side of the street the left side of the street yeah. now it's both sides i remember paperboy two it's tough it is tough yeah but well paperboy one is also tough both paperboys are right. tough the original paperboy has since seen a re-release on a variety of arcade game collections for various systems like the playstation the gamecube the ps2 xbox windows and i think really any major like midway themed arcade collection or atari themed arcade collection probably has a version of paperboy in it might not necessarily be the arcade version it might be the nes port that is popular when it comes to putting arcade games onto newer platforms sometimes they'll just use like an nes or a master system port but it is available needless to say however uh, a full version of the arcade game is able to be accessed in the 2015 lego dimensions video game uh you build out a little arcade at one point and it has a couple of arcade games like defender but also paperboy that's fun yeah yeah paperboy is like one of those one of those games that gets bundled in with a lot of it does yeah and 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 things. paperboy the character uh appeared as a background character in wreck it ralph another fun fact but you can't play as paperboy in super smash no yeah so that's gonna be our paperboy episode that is a paperboy episode the episode about paperboy that is our episode about paperboy if you didn't think that we could do obscure video games i like this episode because i feel like it's a return to form a return to form like a classic classic gaming brothers episode i'm talking like episodes like within the within the early digits like 15 20 one of those episodes we've departed from our, <laughs> our no, classic not at all. gaming brothers not at all. theme I, I mean it's very specific we're talking about one game and the game is also very basic so it's very difficult to go on and describe the game in detail because there's the plot is you're a paper boy well so i mean if we were to talk more about paper boy one thing i would say i think it does come from this era of arcade games where the purpose of the game was to rack up a high score so that your name would be on the high score chart for your friends to see so you could come to the arcade with your friends and say hey that right there those three initials that spell out the word ass that's my that's me i put that there and, and I think a lot of games were doing that, obviously, because that was a, a selling point. You know, you came to the arcade so that you could get the high score and to get the high score, you put in more quarters and that's how you, that's how games made money. Right. Versus like a ticket game system, which you would then take the tickets and exchange them for physical merchandise. You were able to just get bragging rights with playing a game like Paperboy or I always felt like the games where you could get top scores were always more enjoyable than the games where you would get tickets. I think so too. But games that you would get tickets from would be able to be turned in for real merchandise. But I also think something cool with Paperboy is it does feel like one of those games that marked a change in era between the 1970s style arcade games and the like early 80s style arcade games. Because of its release in 85, it was really a post video game crash arcade game, which I think also was probably why it saw a home release so much sooner because the arcade wasn't doing very hot in 85 um considering the market crashed in 83 i guess what i'm trying to drive home is that it does remind me of other arcade games that had come out prior that were a little less advanced specifically tapper which uh also goes by the name of root beer tapper plays like very similarly to paperboy if you think about it i mean in both games you go up and down like a side of the screen and you throw something down the the other side at your target in in root beer tapper you're hitting bar patrons or or, or if you're playing it at a bar, it was Budweiser Tapper. Um, so you're throwing beer, not root beer. But like, I think there was like that time period where games were very simple because the whole point was you're just driving your score up. I don't actually know when when games stop, stopped being as simple as like Paperboy and Tapper. <laughs> 
and when they started getting more advanced like some of the shooters and stuff that we saw but i mean it wouldn't be it would be only a few years later that we started seeing like games like virtual cop and and time crisis and stuff come to the arcades gunblade new york, gunblade new york. or with the, the space shooters that we talked about um like though even those games still have a they still had a high score component to them they did because even even to like the racing games like cruising usa had like a high score component they did but i think the difference with those was that when i go to the arcade and i play time crisis i'm not necessarily always playing to rack up the highest score i'm playing because time crisis is a fun game and i'm having a great Mm. time just blasting things whereas if i go to an arcade and i'm playing like miss pac-man or root beer tapper or paperboy yeah they are fun games but also i really do try to play to get my name up on the leaderboard even if i'm not placed number one i always found great satisfaction in getting my name in the top 10 list of the arcade machines that were the old like miss pac-man or galaga or something like that versus when i was playing time crisis i didn't really care i mean i would just play to blow blow stuff up and i think especially if you're drunk <laughs> yeah especially if you're drunk but i think there i think there is kind of like that transition to that period and i think paperboy kind of was like smack dab right in the center of that transitionary period you you had games that were classic and simple but they were getting a little more complex and also just becoming fun so that being said we're going to get into our buy weight pass segment of the show where we talk about games that we are interested in buying waiting or passing on seth what game are you excited about buy waiting or passing on My my byweight pass is going to be the Grand Casino Tycoon, which was developed by or is being developed by Still Alive Studios. Uh, Still Alive worked on Bus Simulator 16 through 21, which is a lot of bus simulation, and also a couple other games uh, like Rescue HQ and Drone Swarm. Now, in Rescue HQ, you build the base of operations for, a, it's like a joint base of operations between police, fire, and ambulance, and you attempt to respond and rescue people. While in Grand Casino Tycoon, you build a casino, and you try to take people's money by enticing them with gambling. Now, I enjoy these type of building games, uh, and I think that building a, cas- ca- a casino is pretty niche, like kind of like building a hotel or something. Um, And there's not a lot of like hotel or casino type building games since most of them revolve around like theme hospital is like a popular like so hospitals are a popular genre for building uh, games. There's some prison stuff. There's your standard like life simulator like the Sims. But like casinos are kind of like an untapped market. So I I, I definitely feel like I'm interested in this game because I like these simulator type games. So it's a definite wish list candidate and possibly a buy. So if I'm indecisive, it's going to be a wait. And so, Zach, what about you? What's your buy wait pass? The game that I was excited about buy waiting or passing on is Dusk 82, uh, which was developed by Dave Samansky and uh, published by New Blood Interactive. Now, Dusk 82 is a demake of Dusk, which was uh, and is one of my favorite first-person shooter games that came out a few years ago. Dusk 82 turns the high-octane first-person shooter Dusk into a game very similar to Chip's Challenge or Sokoban. (laughs) So it's like a top-down puzzle game where you have to push blocks and solve puzzles d makes are hilarious they are hilarious and this looks great it's using like ascii style graphics similar to like zzt uh it just looks fantastic i will probably definitely buy it um it's currently listed as a coming soon trademark with like a trademark after soon so i i don't honestly know when it's due out I, I, it looks like it's coming along in production though um but it, it, it looks like it's gonna be a fun game so it's probably gonna be a buy and uh it will be a recently played for me once i get a chance to actually play it so yeah that's uh dusk 82 that will be a buy for me fun 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 it's that time it's that time where we tell you about how to contact us Listen to us and support us. First, if you want to contact us, let's say you listened to this episode and you really enjoyed Paperboy and you wanted to tell us about your Paperboy experience. We love reading those emails. We love reading emails about your experiences with games that we talk about. And if you have experiences with games that we have not talked about and we can always recollect and reminisce together, you could do so. You can always reach out to us by sending us an email at classicgamingbrothers at gmail.com. 
You can also send it to Seth at ClassicGamingBrothers.com or Zach at ClassicGamingBrothers.com or ClassicGamingBrothers at ClassicGamingBrothers. And if that's not your, if you are opposed to sending emails but still want to write a letter, you can send us a, a contact form by going to our website, which our website is ClassicGamingBrothers.com. And at the website, you can uh, fill out the form and send us over a message, which will go to our email, we'll respond, and we just love hearing from fans, so let us know how you feel. Now, you could also, if you send us an email, you get put into our prize drawing of a free game. So who doesn't like free games? Send us an email. Let's say you're on that website, you could head over to the lounge and listen to us right there. Answers your question how to listen to us. You can also listen to us however you're listening to us right now. You can just keep doing that. I'm sure you're hearing us voices here but we're also if you're listening to us through a method that you prefer not to or found us somewhere online maybe you want to listen to us on a phone app uh, you can check us out we're on most of the listening apps applications that are available such as spotify stitcher and itunes there are now supporting us this is probably the most important part of the episode for you to hear how to support us since we always like to be supported the number one way to support us is listen to our show we appreciate the listen we appreciate the downloads and we appreciate you hearing our content and that's really it you can if you so desire and you wish to support us a little bit more you can give us a rating on whatever listening app that you so desire to listen listen to us on and give us a uh, a rating the ratings help us with the, the podcast with discoverability and discoverability means more people can listen to classic gaming brothers and what's not better than listening to more people finally you can support us by following us on all of our social medias and we've got a bunch of them we have a facebook which is at classic gaming brothers we have an instagram that is also at classic gaming brothers we have a twitch which is twitch.tv slash classic gaming brothers and we have a twitter which is cg brothers pod so if you could follow all those and we will announce when our episodes are and that's pretty much all we do on social media it's just it's announce true. what our episodes we think about doing other things on social media and engaging with our audience but we're bad at doing most things so uh, including playing video games so if you have three friends and they need podcasts to listen to let them know classic gaming brothers is a pretty cool podcast let them know that they can pick some episodes of topics that we cover that they might want to listen to and if it's the early episodes good luck it's been a while since those things things have been out and things have changed so with that that's how you can contact us Listen to us and support us. Zach, did I forget anything else? I always forget. Don't play games like my brother. And don't play games like my brother. I've been Zach. And I've been Seth. We've been the Classic Gaming Brothers. That's That's right. right. Oh, my favorite Paperboy obstacle is the Grim Reaper. I, that is a good, that is a good obstacle. I still like the, either the burglar or the two guys fighting.